Dr. Janine Beisman, board certified pediatric and adolescent neuropsychologist, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure, David. What is autism? Some core characteristics are challenges socializing, maybe having conversations, having effective friendships, reading social cues. Other challenges may be getting rigid, fixated interests and patterns of behavior. There's a sensory component, meaning what people hear or see or touch may be overwhelming in some way. So you may see some children who have to crawl under a desk during a fire alarm because it's way too overwhelming for them. Or you may see a child who can only wear certain clothing of a certain texture because otherwise it's painful. Even maintaining eye contact may be painful for a person affected with autism. And some kids seem to be so withdrawn they don't communicate, they don't have any kind of interaction. And then other kids I see with autism, they're high functioning, their reading level is great, their math level is great, they're in school doing well. Some children are very much more noticeably in their own worlds and needing to withdraw and do their own thing. And those kids are very noticeable to the naked eye because they're not involved and engaged. Where it gets tricky sometimes is with those children who have different kinds of capacities and can interact and want to socialize and do make eye contact and can be very engaging, but it's more nuanced and fine-tuned and sometimes their challenges go unnoticed. When does a child really start to display symptoms of autism? Symptoms emerge early. That may be more noticeable at 12 months, uh, maybe not even noticeable until elementary school in some cases. Yet yeah, doesn't it seem sometimes that autism is just sort of the catchphrase of the day as opposed to maybe the child doesn't have autism, maybe the child is just has bad behavior? I believe that any behavior a child exhibits is driven by some underlying need or some reason. So can a child get mislabeled with autism? Yes, um, and it is a little bit more of a catchphrase just because I think realistically we are detecting more children who are affected by this constellation of symptoms. Early intervention makes a huge difference. There's a camp of intervention, which is developmentally based and relationship based, which is really digging for kids' internal resources, helping them to understand their own emotional states and to self-regulate, to self-organize, and tends to go much deeper than behavioral models are able to accomplish. I personally practice a method called DIR floor time, which speaks to what I was indicating before about really developing relationships and understanding important developmental milestones. It may involve playing with children. It may involve uh, other activities of teaching. Um, and then some parents may choose hippotherapy or work with animals, uh, music therapy occupational therapy or speech therapy. Is it a brain chemistry issue or are there environmental factors? Is the brain involved? Without question. Are genetics involved? Without question. But there may be more to the picture with different subtypes that becomes uncovered as the research unfolds. Why are parents advocating so heavily for children with autism, even more so than other behavioral illnesses that I see these days? Do you follow what I'm saying? I follow what you're saying. Autism is a very big word and it carries a lot of emotional weight with it. Um, and activates a lot of parents into trying to get the right kind of advocacy. Part of the fight is about parent choice. Parents don't want to be told one size fits all and this is, these are the services I'm going to offer and this is the way in which I'm going to treat your child. And I think that's where parents most get in an uproar, that they don't have the choice to decide among evidence-based practices what is the best pathway for their child. Dr. Janine Weisman, thank you so very much for being here. Thank you, David.